Well, good night, everyone. So happy to all have you all here at the Bali. Also, on behalf of uh, ITFA Documentary Festival, I say a uh, very, very welcome to you all. It's a great honor to have you here with a few very special guests tonight and a special film. Tonight, we're going to see the film, the documentary, the debut uh, of Mariam Saray, Born in Evin, about her secret history being born in the most notorious prison in Iran in the 80s. But um, before we go to see the film, we have a, um, a creative introduction uh, by um, Sahan Saheb Divani. He is a storyteller. He invented storytelling to this level uh, himself. He has a festival. He has the Mezrap. Who knows the Mezrap? Oh, wow. You, all, you are fans of Sahan, I guess. Well. I don't need to tell you anything about Sahant. He will tell a story, um, a special story about imprisonment. And then we're going to see the film, the debut by Mariam Zareh. And after the film, she's not uh, able to be here. So she allowed us to uh, set up an alternative uh, program. And we have a very special guest from London. She just came in, she just flew in and uh, arrived. Her name is uh, uh, Shadi Sadr, and she is a human rights lawyer. She's an activist, and she's also the co-founder of Justice for Iran. It's an organization who, um, well, the word says, or the name says it all, who tries to find some justice and peace for uh, people in Iran. And um, she is also part of the film. Uh, she has uh, done research, she has informed Mariam, she has helped her making this film about this very, uh, well, difficult and uh, layered uh, history of Iran. But it's still going on. Well, my name is Parvin Mirahimi, just forgot to say. Um, <laughs> I'm a program editor here at the Bali, uh, and I'm very honored and happy that you are all here. So let's... See Sahant, please stay seated after the film, and then we will have the, the, the conversation with Shadi. And you are all uh, welcome to ask her some questions about this topic. So, Sahant Saheb Divani, okay. take the Thank stage. You. It's uh, 1984, and I see my father get killed in front of my eyes by Ayatollah Khomeini. N not, not really, uh, my father is still alive. But I don't know this because I'm four years old, and I am in a tiny little room somewhere in the far west of Amsterdam. And this room has been filled by people that I know because they're all my uncles and aunts. You see, when you're a kid in the Netherlands, the 40 Iranians who live in this country, they're all your uncles and aunts. But suddenly this man appears on stage who has this beard longer than mine today, who has an amame, and he has a gun. And my father's hands are being tied behind him next to two other people. Later, my father would explain to me that uh, one has put on some glasses, so he is the intellectual. The other one has put on some work clothes, so he is the worker. And my father in the middle, who looked very handsome, he was, of course, the court. Yes, he standing in the middle made a speech about uh, free rights for the Kurds and for the laborers and for the intellectuals, and then Khomeini shot him. Now, at the age of four, I don't know what theater is. So at the age of four, I freak out. I start to shout, Khomeini killed my father. Now, of course, the first time that I say it, the people in the audience, they start to laugh a little bit because this is a very serious political play, right? This is a, a cry for justice by the Iranian community in the Netherlands, all 50 of them crammed in a little community center in the far west of Amsterdam. And suddenly the kid of one of the actors on stage is crying out, my father was just killed by Khomeini. Some actually think it adds some realism to the play, but I don't stop crying. I keep on saying, Khomeini killed my father. And then the second, third, fourth time that I say it, suddenly even the ones who were on stage and were executed start to laugh a little bit, which does not add to the realism of the piece at all. And one of my uncles gets up and says, it's just a game. 
don't worry, this is not real, but how can this man convince me otherwise of what I just saw happen on stage? Khomeini killed my father. So I keep crying, Khomeini killed my father, and this man takes me in his arms and with my feet dangling and my head to the other side, he starts walking me out of the stage while I'm crying for dear life. Khomeini killed my father. Khomeini killed my father. 1984. It's uh, 2010 when I am a theater maker. Now I'm standing not in a small community center in the far west of Amsterdam, I'm standing in a big theater in Amsterdam. I'm making political theater, and I hope slightly better than what my father did back in the day. I'm standing there in front of the intellectuals, the, the, the interested, mostly left-leaning audiences of the Netherlands, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling them about the history of Iran, and I sing Iranian political songs, Saru Madzemes, now, my father at the premiere of the piece, I don't know how, managed to sit right in front of me. My father is a very stoic man. I've seen my father cry once in his life before that night. And while I'm standing there singing this song, suddenly I see that the eyes of my father tear up. Now, when the show is over, I realize that he must be proud that his son, in making theater, had that effect on him. But I also realize that my father is not that touched by my rendition of this song that he has heard a million times. So afterwards, when the show is over, I go to him and uh, we talk about the show, and he says, oh, that wasn't bad. No, that was okay. But I have to ask you, why did you pick that song? I say, Papa, of course, this is a song of the revolution, right? This is a song that you used to sing back in the day. This is a song that you and your comrades in prison have been singing for countless of times. And he says, uh, yes, there were many songs. Why did you pick this one? I say, Dad, this is the one that, I don't know, I was, what do you mean, why did I pick that song? And he said, you don't know that this is the song that the words of which my friend composed, with whom I was in prison, 1973. 1973 is when my father gets a knock on the door and uh, they kick open the door because they don't open it up quickly enough and both my father and mother are arrested and they're put in jail and um, it's all very romantic, he tells me later, because I'm too young to actually understand the horrors of prison. Yeah, I was in one cell and your mother was in another and uh, uh, your mother had the luck of being in a cell with someone who knew Morse code. And I had the luck of being in a cell where a prisoner had cut Morse code in the bottom of the wall so I could translate the little ticks that I would hear on the pipes of the heating, and I would have a conversation with your mother, and we would say things like, uh, I saw you walking in the street last week. Ding, 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 ding. You were looking really nice with your red dress. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, you naughty boy, you were looking at my red dress. Ding, 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 ding. 1983 is uh, when my father did not go to prison. He was very lucky. Sometimes that's all what saves a person. The friends of his who were in the same prison back in, they were not so lucky and they were sent to Evin. My father, by the way, in 1977 was in Evin, but that was before the revolution. It was only 16 days, so that doesn't count, right? It's the Evin of after the revolution that we talk about. Okay, back to 1983. My father didn't go to Evin in 83. He, um, he missed it by a fluke, by a chance. And what he missed was the arrest of his friends, including the one that had composed the words of the song that he would sing in prison and I would sing on stage and the friend didn't make it, and his wife didn't make it, and my father luckily did, because he instead sat on a horse and went over the mountains. And I would follow six months later. I don't know anything about this story, because I'm only three years old, and uh, uh, I do know 
that uh, I think it's very cold the way that we've decided to travel. Uh, I don't know much about travel, but I'm kind of considering that uh, probably this isn't the most comfortable way. There is mountains and there is a horse that I sit on. Somewhere over there is my mother. And I have no idea where my father is. Neither geographically nor chronologically. Uh, I kind of suspect that that's what we're leaving behind, never to return, and that's a place of unknown, and uh, I really miss my father. Oh, yeah, 1983 is also the year that in Evin Mariam is born, who would later make a film that they will show in the Bali, but that's for later, okay. Um, we make it over the mountains, in 1983, and I'm brought to another prison, this time in Turkey, Bayram Pasha. I go to the Bayram Pasha prison and uh, I see a big metal door um, behind which is my father. Now, you see, here is the confusion because uh, it's a lot of dates and uh, it's quite a few countries. Uh, there is a lot of things that happened in between and my father somewhere in this journey has lost his name. Uh, Khanum Asad, you were asking the name of my father, right? Do you remember his last name? You were asking. Saheb Divani. Yeah, you see, um, now, here in 73, his name is Saheb Divani. Somewhere over there, his name is again Saheb Divani. But somewhere in this travel, he couldn't take that name, Saheb Divani. It got lost in the travel. It got lost in translation, okay? So somewhere here, there is a man in prison, but now his name is Saifullah al-Lahdad al-Darabili. Um, I am three years old, this is a name that's too difficult for me to remember. So if I go to my father in prison, I will just go up to him and as a young theater maker, will just go and say, Baba Ali. It's not how Iranians speak to their father, right? No, but uh, now we have a problem because if I go to my father and if I say Baba Ali, Ali, not the name that's in his passport, um, maybe one of the Turkish guards will be smart enough to say that's a different name than say Fullah, and then he will be sent back, back to his country, back to the, okay. So I can't go. I, uh, I'm kept behind that metal door. I don't see my father. Actually, it's not the whole story, because uh, later I do see my father in that prison, in the Bayram Pasha prison. Um, it's something that I don't quite remember. Um, it's, it's something that my father later said to me. He said that, Sahan, by the time that you were allowed to see me in that prison, so many things had happened and so much time had passed without you seeing me and I, I looked different and maybe that's what it was. Maybe it was the fact that you didn't want to think that that man that you saw in that little cell, who before you saw as someone very proud and big, uh, now was sitting there with his shoulders hunched. You didn't want to consider that that's your father. Whatever the reason, you were hiding behind the legs of your mother. And then all I could do to call you to me was to say, Bachajan, come here. Hey, kid. Hey, you like stories, right? Come. And then I could see that the word story kind of made you make a tiny little step to the front. And then I continued and I said, uh, do you know the story of the man who, who, who goes to the market to buy an aubergine? Now this is a man who doesn't know what an aubergine looks like because usually the wife does the shopping and uh, she buys the aubergines, he likes to eat them. But you know, now she's cooking, she forgot to buy the aubergine, so he has to buy it and he's asking people, what does an aubergine look like? And uh, they tell him, well, it's a bit fat with a green hat, and he thinks, ah, and then he comes home with the terrified imam that he's gonna put in the soup. <laughs> and you start to laugh. You start to laugh because you realize that only your father in a prison cell can tell such a stupid story. And that's the moment that you run up to me and you hold me and you don't let go. And I didn't let go and it doesn't matter where we are in the timeline, we still hold on and we still tell each other stories. Um, 2007. 
2007, I decide that I want to go and visit that prison uh, in Turkey, the Bayram Pasha, of which there is this memory that I remember the door and uh, calling my father or not calling him Baba Ali, and the memory that I don't have, which is of my father seeing me and me seeing him and me not recognizing him and him telling me a story. Um, I go to Turkey, to Istanbul, to Bayram Pasha, and uh, I'm looking around for people to see if uh, they can help me to find this prison. Now, in the center of Istanbul, everyone speaks perfect English. And in the center, wherever you ask someone something, they will answer you and uh, they will send you along the way. But in the people's area, Bayram Pasha, where that prison stood, no one speaks English. Now, luckily, there is uh, quite a few words of Persian and Turkish that are similar. So I can stand there and I can ask with my few words of Persian, Turkish, French, English, pardon, uh, Zendan, uh, Haps, Hapsihane, Nerde. Where is it? Bayram Pasha, Nerde, Zendan. And in Turkish, people would say something that I wouldn't understand and they would say, mm, and I don't know. But I would keep insisting, and finally they would point me to a place, and I would just start walking, and then again, and again, and again. And then I realized, actually, what they're pointing at, because when I made it to the end of the road, I was standing in a place where there used to be a prison. The courtyard was still there, and the outer walls were still there, and the rubble of the walls that used to be the prison, they were now standing on a big pile, and all the metal doors, one of which I must have stood behind, all of them stood there like oversized dominoes, and I thought this is something that belonged to me at some point in my life, and I wanted to take a picture of it, but the guard came and sent me home, so now it's just a memory of a story of something that I can tell here. And that prison doesn't exist. And uh, the other prison, the one over here, the one that my father and mother had all those romantic times that he told me about and the horrible times that he didn't tell me about, that prison, Qasr, is now a museum. And there's another prison which kind of always existed and maybe always will exist, who knows? Well, it's still there. And there's films about it. And there's people born in it. And there are stories to be told. And one of those stories we will hear. Thank you. So, please welcome with me on stage social justice lawyer, activist, Shadi Sutter. Thank you so much for being with us today, Shadi. Thank you all for staying with us. I really appreciate it, since we have uh, a special guest here all the way from London. It's such a big honor. Also for Mariam, you know her very well. We are going to talk about that. Um, um, but first, briefly about yourself, Shadi. Um, um, uh, sorry. Um, you are here tonight, uh, despite of the current... Uh, um, uh, yeah, the uprising in Iran. There's a lot going on at this moment, and you are involved as an activist, as a lawyer, helping people in Iran. Can you tell us a little bit about what's happening at this very moment in Iran uh, for the people maybe who don't know uh, the situation? Yeah, it's already on. You can just start talking. Thank you, Thank you so much, And I will stop the, talking. Um, uh, yeah, it's... Um, also an honor for me to be here with you and to watch the uh, film for the second time. I was, um, I, I watched the film for the first time in its premiere in Bernilane and I, when, before I came to this room, I thought that, okay, so this, this time I wouldn't cry, but I couldn't help myself, uh, I, I just cried. And um, the film is so moving, but uh, 
since Parvin wanted me to talk about what is going on to Iran, and I, I just started with that. Um, as uh, I guess you have seen uh, reports in the newspapers, in um, the TV channels uh, about uh, uh, the popular nationwide protest uh, which started about two weeks ago when the government uh, um, tripled the price of uh, uh, gas and um, with already um, struggling in, a, in an already struggling economy. So it's meant to millions of people a lot uh, uh, harder life. And then at the same time, uh, uh, they have suffered for years uh, uh, from the lack of uh, freedom, uh, human rights violations, uh, um, corruptions, and, uh, and all uh, for all of them, the government only blamed the sanctions or the enemy outside. So uh, people took uh, into streets and they started uh, peacefully protesting. And by 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 saying that peacefully protesting, I I mean uh, they use the the methods such as just they stop their cars in the middle of highways just to show their uh, uh, objection to this government uh, policy. But then soon after that, like in less than 48 hours, the government started, as usual, a severe crackdown into the uh, uh, protesters. And, uh, and then at the same time, they shut down the internet. Uh, so the country was just um, went into a completely blackout from the outside world. So no one knew uh, what was going on inside the country. And they took the advantage of that situation and killed at least uh, 143 uh, protesters in, in the streets. And according to the, according to the Amnesty International's latest statistics, and we are now waiting for the, another update tomorrow, the death toll would increase into at least 300. And, and also, according to one of the government's officials, it's not an official statistic, but it's kind of officials, more than 7,000 uh, protesters are now in prisons. And, uh, and as we know from the other protests, so, uh, they are under enormous pressure to confess in front of the camera against themselves, saying that, yeah, we were a bunch of thugs and terrorists. So we were looting and destroying public uh, property. So that's why we, 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 we kind of des deserve to be here and to be killed in the streets. So that's uh, the developments, the sad developments in, in uh, going on in Iran. And as human rights organizations, the uh, activists, so we are we all trying to uh, document as much as we can uh, the atrocities and uh, to raise awareness uh, at international level. Uh, the next three months will be so crucial for all of us. And uh, now, uh, at this moment, I would like to ask all of you to do whatever you can, to do whatever in your capacity to uh, spread the word talk about the uh, people who are now being suppressed by the government. Um, yeah, I just stopped yes, talking. No, yo, you are an activist. So uh, we, we get to that, to the current situation, because this is only the situation of today. And uh, we are going back at least 30 years. Um, but let's start with... Now, yeah, yeah, we are in 40. 40, 40 uh, yeah. since uh, the, the start of the, the revolution. revolution. Yeah. But we, we start with you, Shadi. Um, you studied law in Iran, and even before you went to university, you worked as a journalist uh, at a very young age. Um, you have been working in Iran quite a, quite a while, quite a long time, until 2009. Is yeah. that correct? Yes. Um, and you uh, worked as a human rights lawyer and you founded also a organization for uh, women in vulnerable situations. Um, but can you, can you tell us a little 
about what happened then. What was what was happening, and why did you leave Iran? Because you were you had a great organization, you had a good practice in law. What happened? Yeah, as as you mentioned, I uh, I lived in Iran um, until 2009 when I was uh, 35 years old. So by then, I. Um, 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 I was a lawyer. I had um, a very good job, and uh, and also I've been. Uh, I was quite um, busy with women's rights activism and women's rights movement. But then, um, so I think uh, I should mention that history. The first uh, um, legal center for vulnerable women um, in two, in early 2000. And we provided legal services to women who uh, didn't have money to defend themselves or, hi or hire a, a lawyer. And also we defended women who had uh, been sentenced to stoning uh, uh, to death. And, but in 2006, um, um, a group of women's rights activists, including myself, were arrested. And then the government, the security, the, the Ministry of Intelligence, uh, uh, closed down the, the center, uh, the legal center. I spent um, two weeks in solitary confinement, but I was released on bail and I continued my work uh, with my other um, colleagues and friends. And then again in 2009, I was arrested in one of, in my way to one of those um, protests, one of the protests uh, um, after the 2009 uh, presidential election. And again, with the help of my friends um, outside Iran, I was, um, so they uh, basically uh, put a enormous pressure on the Iranian government to release me, and they, then I was released on bail. But soon after that, I just discovered that they would come after me again, because, uh, so in one of the indictments after the uh, protests, uh, the Tehran's prosecutor accused me of being the leader of uh, women's branch of the Velvet Revolution. It's a silly uh, accusation, but uh, it meant that they would come after me again, and this time I wouldn't be uh, released anytime soon. So I had to leave the country. I spent a few months in Germany, but then I ended up in London and uh, uh, with my uh, friend and colleague, Shadi Amin. You saw her in the film. She's in, also here tonight. She's also here we tonight. We will talk to class. her as well. Yeah. And uh, so we established a human rights organization, Justice for Iran, because uh, the problem that uh, we have suffered, uh, and the, the Iranian society have experienced it uh, for four decades, more than four decades now, is the issue of impunity. So as you saw in the film, the victims have uh, been so long waiting uh, for justice to uh, deliver, and it uh, has not come true at all. So uh, Justice for Iran uh, tries to, our aim is to uh, abolish uh, the culture of impunity, and, uh, and also uh, we try to find um, international, use international mechanisms in order to hold the perpetrators of uh, serious human rights violations accountable. Uh, we use different methods such as human rights sanctions, the EU human rights sanctions, uh, UN advocacy, and also we uh, have tried to initiate litigations against the perpetrators who happen to uh, be somewhere in the world that uh, uh, the, the courts have jurisdiction over uh, investigating the crimes uh, occurred in Iran. Interesting. We get to that as well. Uh, since you've, you mentioned the film, let's switch uh, to the film uh, a bit. Um, how did you get involved with Mariam and with this, uh, with this very interesting project? Yeah, uh, the first time that I heard about the project was definitely and um, yeah, clearly from my friend Shadi Amin. Shadi is a friend of Mariam's uh, mother. And uh, I heard that one of the children. I didn't know Mariam, and I didn't know, I, I, I knew Mariam's mother, but I didn't know Mariam, I not, uh, never met her. Um, but Shadi told me that she was born in Evin, and she is one of those children who um, uh, were born in uh, prisons. Uh, uh, and so it, it seemed to me very interesting, because as you saw in the film, there are not many uh, children belong to 
uh, or b born from uh, mothers or fathers pol in, in basically belong to the political um, families who wants to talk about their past mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, that's a big theme in the film. Yeah, Not only the, the being sentenced or, exactly. or imprisoned, but the Iranian culture yeah. and, uh, and not able to, to speak openly about these traumas. Um, I, but, but one thing that I, can, I, I need to mention is that it's not the case with the prisoners themselves. The survivors, most of them, uh, uh, wants to talk about their past. And I think one of the reasons that the children, do, the children don't want to um, talk about the, the past is that some, some, somehow they have been overwhelmed with those memories and they want to just keep distance from those memories or uh, identify themselves as they want uh, to be not as the children of political prisoners or activists or the children of uh, the victims uh, but there are other reasons to that um, but but yeah it seemed to me very interesting and then I don't remember uh, exactly when, but Mariam contacted me asking for some uh, material because um, for our projects on um, documentation, documenting the atrocities in uh, the 1980s or um, yeah, the 1980s basically, uh, and in particular the massacre of 1988 of thousands of political pr prisoners. So we uh, have collected. Um, enormous uh, audiovisual material. Um, we interviewed more over, I think, two, uh, 200 survivors and the families of the victims. Uh, and uh, so Mariam contacted me asking for some footage. Some, some Most of them live abroad or still in Iran? Uh, or, or I can say one, one, third, one third of those who ha who, um, whom we interviewed uh, uh, were based in Iran. In Iran. In Iran, yes. Interesting. Uh, yeah, and uh, and then so um, and then the, the the organization Justice for Iran got involved with the film. Not very much, but any time that Mariam wanted um, some footage, some material, some, some consultation, like, yeah, some advice. Uh, so we were there for her, as we have done for other projects. So in the film, you saw Shora McCarmy, and Mariam mentioned that Shora. Uh, because Shora's mother was uh, a victim of 1988 massacre, and she, in, during the, uh, like, uh, the shooting of this film, Shora was also making her own film. And today, when I just got out from the plane, I saw Shora's Facebook post that uh, uh, she just uh, um, said that uh, the premiere of my film is in the 10th of December, the International Human Rights Day. Really? Yeah, so yeah. You should and see that. Yeah, I, I would try love to see to, it. Yeah, I would yeah. love to see it. We we could maybe get it to the Bali as well. Yeah. So, why not? so you mentioned uh, her quite a few uh, times already. Your uh, name, fellow name, how do you say it? She has the same name as you, Shadi. <laughs> You are filming, yeah, but I'm right. going to ask you as well. Uh, you didn't want to sit over there, but you came all the way from Frankfurt to uh, to. No, she was in London. Oh, she wants to sit. Oh, take my seat. Oh. Hi. Hi. Well, now we have two shadies. Yeah. Well. Just take a seat. Yeah. You can also take my water. I didn't sip. Hi, so. everybody. It's clean. <clears throat> so uh, we saw you in this film. You doing this little uh, ther therapeutic, therapeutic session yeah. with uh, Mariam yeah. with the little uh, puppets. Uh, can you tell us a little about the yeah the work you do with this the the, the yeah the trauma yeah, yeah how do you say the working with trauma and yeah. uh, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me on this stage. It's an honor to sit you here. should be there. To talk about Mariam's film and about all the issues that she's mentioning in the film. So uh, I did, uh, it was a one day uh, setting we had together. So I do uh, systemic therapy and it is a method that you try to uh, um, set 
set up the person in the place that the, 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 the mother in this case was to understand how she felt and to understand how was the situation for her from a distance. So, and she has to put all the figures in the place that they have been at that time. And in this case, she realized it was a sad situation. It was more than three hours uh, setting we had together. So uh, for me was in, because I know Mariam as she was about six years old and the mother is one of my best friends in Frankfurt. So uh, uh, for me was in, important, it was not important for me to be in the film or to take part in the project. For me it was important that Mariam uh, can understand what is she going through. And I think she's smart enough to know what she started and how she uh, has to end it. And uh, we see the result. And I think uh, the setting was, for me and for Mariam, really successful. It was interesting for her to see at, that at the same time that the mother is in the, in the prison, the father is somewhere and she's somewhere else and the parents and grandmoms uh, and grandfather is somewhere else and they have no connection. And it's not something that they decided to do or they decided to be there. So it is their uh, wall between them. Yeah. They are a crowd of people who have the same situation under the, uh, in, the, in the prison. So it, it was what we did. To um, also, um, so Marianne could, sh could see the situation also from her mother's yeah. and also her father's perspective yeah. to uh, not only see it from her own. Um, yeah. Did you do many of these sessions with uh, people who have a similar story as Marianne? Yeah. Yes? With, yeah. I do it with um, victims of uh, um, so human rights violation in Iran, also with LGBTI people who uh, try to understand why the society and why the parents doesn't accept them. It's important to try to, to understand them too, to make a connection between them and their situation, why they are homophobic, why they can't accept them. And so to try to, to, to show them that they are not, it's not their guilt, it's not their responsibility, but they are responsible to, to save themselves, to protect themselves, so, and to survive. So. Beautiful, all those perspectives, and it's really em empathetic. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank please. you very much. No, thank no, please you. be seated, oh. stay seated, but uh, if, you, if you want, I would love you oh, it's to good. stay seated. I, I, I you just take the water. To have water so Sh thank you. Uh, uh, Shadi in the, in the red uh, jacket. Um, let's go to the, to the 80s, where the film starts. Um, can you tell us a little about um, what was happening back then? Why were all these people put in prisons, sentenced, even with kids, uh, families separated? What happened then for us who, who don't know? Yeah, I think everyone knows that in 1979, a revolution happened in Iran, and it was a popular revolution. Uh, different political uh, groups and organization uh, were involved in the revolution, from leftist organizations, communist, Leninist, to nationalist, and also from religious, Islamist, or Marxist, uh, uh, Marxist Islamist. Uh, so they were uh, really a diverse revolution, and everyone thought that, okay, so uh, we made that revolution happen together. So in the future, so the, the future of the country, we will build it. Uh, and we overthrow a dictator, the Shah, and now uh, everything is going to be very glorious. Uh, but unfortunately, the reality was completely um, unexpectedly uh, yeah, unexpectedly, the, re the religious uh, groups uh, heading by Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, they, um, they took over the power gradually, and, uh, and in 
at the beginning with the supports of some uh, nationalists, uh, as well as some uh, even leftist organizations. And then, uh, so they started with uh, um, violating the freedom of press. Uh, they closed down uh, the progressive newspapers. And then, uh, an, um, bar association, the lawyers. So they violated or they banned the right to defend. And then at the end, they uh, started to, uh, the, a brutal crackdown against the political opponent, the organizations, and then they arrested in, like in less than a few months, they arrested thousands of political activists, most of them were very young, and put them in prisons. Uh, so from 1979 to 1981, uh, when the crackdown really started, uh, so the country experienced a little bit of relatively freedom, but then soon after that, the crackdown started. And then the mass execution started, human rights violation, and at the same time, Iran uh, Iran Iraq war started. So the war as a, a, um, as a justification to uh, internal oppression uh, had been used very well by the religious authorities. And in 1988, right after the Iran Iraq war ended, uh, still in the prison, there were thousands of prisoners that served. Uh, uh, about eight, seven, four uh, years, their sentences, and they were be, uh, uh, they were going to be uh, free very soon. So the government, uh, the, the authorities decided to get rid of them once and for all. So they, uh, the 1988 uh, massacre uh, occurred in the summer of 1988, and in the course of less than two months, they killed. Uh, more than 5,000 political prisoners. So the whole generation that Maryam's mother and father belonged to, and also Shadi and uh, her friends belonged to, were basically destroyed. It's unbelievable what you're telling us. Um, I'm asking you both, Shadis, um, maybe one of you uh, or both of you know uh, the answer. Um, women pregnant or with child putting in in prisons in the most devastating uh, circumstances all together in one room um, are there any because people don't want to talk about it maybe are there any stories about what happened inside these prisons with these mothers and their children do you have any maybe some examples of what happened there Definitely, for those who uh, has not left the room already, I just uh, need to say um, the name of the book, Crime and Impunity. Unfortunately, I forget to uh, bring it with myself. Crime and Impunity, um, uh, published by Justice for Iran. Uh, uh, the subject of the book is uh, sexual torture and gender-based violence against female political prisoners in the 80s. So there is a book about that for anyone who wants uh, to know more about this uh, issue. But yeah, the PDF version is available if you want to have a, a, the paper version. So you need to go uh, to, to buy it uh, via Amazon. And uh, but briefly, yes. uh, the book documents uh, the accounts of at least, uh, I think, over 100 female political prisoners, former prisoners, uh, about different kind of uh, sexual torture, as well as gender-based violence, such as motherhood in prison, or giving birth to the child in prison. Uh, in, and by, so sexual torture and abuse in prison, uh, the varied uh, from like um, insulting word, using vulgar words uh, by the prison guards, by the interrogators, to raping virgin girls uh, before the execution. So that uh, uh, kind of torture right before the execution uh, is a kind of unique torture that I have never seen happened in any other context. Um, and in this book, we, um, we, we 
basically proved that it's, it wasn't the rumor, it happened, and it happened in a systematic, not widespread, but systematic way. So our legal analysis in the book uh, at the end uh, concluded that it's uh, a crime against humanity happened only to women, to the virgin girls, so those who didn't marry when they were arrested. And uh, so uh, the way that they used this torture was that uh, when a girl was executed, a um, revolutionary guard would, would go to the girl's home with, to break the news about the execution with uh, some sweets or um, flowers, saying that, uh, I'm here to inform you that your girl was executed last night, and before that, I married to her. And that was the most devastating experience of the families who j just lost their child. And those girls, those young women, they, they didn't do anything, but the, most of them were uh, high school students. They were people who wanted to, some of them simply read some leaflets or hand over the leaflets of the political opposition groups to the others. Uh, and then they, they were, tried by the revolutionary courts, and then they were executed. Things like this, it's devastating, it's disgusting, I don't know what to say. Breaks my heart. Um, things like this still happens, uh, happen in uh, prisons? Th that type of uh, uh, sexual torture? As far as you know, no, of course. No, um, we, haven't, we haven't had any report of using that uh, type of torture in the recent uh, years. But the thing that we are so worried about that, and it happens in the other context of conflict, in the other context of political suppression, is uh, mm, using sexual torture, uh, and in particular rape, as a weapon of suppression and weapon of war. So, and um, I'm just, uh, I, I just wanna add that now, um, mm, hundreds or perhaps thousands of women protesters are in detention centers and we are, as Justice for Iran, we are very concerned about um, their, their condition and, uh, and the fact that they would be uh, subjected to these kind of uh, treatments and uh, abuse. So, okay. well, it's a lot to take in. Um, Sorry. Um, your, your organization, you both work for uh, Justice for Iran, you, you, you founded it together, uh, so you're both co-founders. Um, you're working hard for the situation, for this situation, to, to, to bring some justice for uh, vulnerable, uh, well, people, vulnerable, who try to, to change something in Iran. Um, can you tell something about your organization, what you already achieved maybe, what you, both of you, uh, uh, maybe something linked to the situation we see in the film? People like Nargis and Mariam, maybe. Um, I think one of the most important uh, achievements that any human rights organization can uh, be proud of uh, is uh, raising awareness about the situation. The most important thing for the survivor is uh, to feel that their stories have uh, been heard and there are people there, out there, who are interested to know their stories. And then taking from that, I think the next step for anyone who suffered from um, human rights violations uh, is to see uh, justice. So truth and justice, these are the, the two uh, components that have been so important for us. So we 
don't document human rights abuses just to documenting them, just to document them, just putting into the shelf. So we uh, do research, uh, we, we, we call them um, research for advocacy. So we do advocacy at the EU level as well as the UN level. Uh, for instance, one of our achievements that we are very proud of is uh, that on behalf of some uh, victims, so we, uh, we have managed to convince the EU to add uh, dozens of human rights violators, the perpetrators, into the list of human rights sanctions, uh, which means that these perpetrators, these individuals, are um, cannot travel to any European country and their assets are freezed in any European country. So that, but these are, um, uh, this is justice coming from outside of Iran. But are there, is in, in, the, in like um, uh, the regime in Iran, did they ever bring some sort of justice for people? Like, is there any justice um, uh, recently within the system? Um, I, I just, recently we published a report which is uh, called uh, Iran, um, the context of maximum impunity. And by that, I just give you an example about the level of impunity that the perpetrators enjoy in uh, Iran. Right now, uh, the head of judiciary is someone who is responsible for, uh, the, uh, for extrajudicial killing, one of the responsibilities, I'll, I'll, um, yeah, I go there, uh, for extrajudicial killings of thousands of prisoners in Tehran during the 1988 massacre. And the Minister of Justice is also another responsible for the massacre in another city. The former Minister of Justice was also a colleague, a very good colleague of this current, newly appointed head of judiciary, uh, both responsible for uh, the extrajudicial killings of the prisoner. Mm -hmm. So in such context, you can not expect any kind of justice. It's all interwoven. So, no, yeah, it's, it's like the, the, the maximum impunity context. Yes. Um, uh, to, f to finish up, but to then give the, the, the room. No, I don't. No, I'm going to walk and uh, maybe there are some questions. Just say, can you, Shadid, can you tell us something about the startling discovery you did a few years ago with the audio uh, file you found? And uh, you found a, a file about uh, what was... You don't know? Oh, maybe I made it up, but yeah. uh, maybe. No, it uh, maybe was in a uh, James Bond film. Maybe you made, uh, you found an audio file um, where they, uh, they secretly taped and they were telling something about prisoners and how they, they should treat them. Can you tell us a bit, a bit about the file and also what it, what it did for your, for your case, for your, for your uh, organization? Well, basically, we didn't. We didn't discover that file, we couldn't. Uh, the audio file is a recording of a meeting uh, between the, the then uh, deputy uh, supreme leader, uh, Montazeri, with the uh, members of a committee uh, who were responsible for the uh, 1988 massacres of political prisoners. Uh, and it was recorded, I think, uh, secretly and uh, um, revealed in, uh, I think, in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, by uh, the son of uh, Montazeri, um, the um, uh, deputy of deputy of the Supreme Leader at that time. And it, uh, but it was very important and significant piece of evidence because before that, the only thing that we had to, to confirm the massacre happened and these people, the, these individuals very responsible for uh, the massacre was the accounts of the survivors. But then the audio recording uh, 
proof that those, and, and also until then, the government had denied all of those accounts, yes. saying that it's not true or it's Never not happens. the, yeah, it's not the, 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 the whole picture. The whole uh, but then when the audio file was revealed, uh, it was an undeniable piece of evidence. Uh, not only Justice for Iran, but also the other organizations, and most importantly, Amnesty International, used that audio file and put it in a, a recently published report in, uh, on the 1988 massacre. The, the main, uh, uh, the, the most important thing about the Amnesty's report, uh, which you can find it online, is that uh, it frames the 1988 massacre uh, not just something happened 30, 31 years ago, um, mass killings or mass extrajudicial executions, but has enforced disappearance. Because none of those who were executed by the, by the authorities at that time, their bodies had never, have never been delivered to their families. The families are still looking for the place of burial and the truth about their uh, loved ones. This situation, according to international law, uh, uh, is uh, called enforced disappearance. It's a continuous crime. It's, a, it's an internationally recognized as international crime. Uh, and the audio file uh, helped a lot in um, proving that that continuous crime is happening to the families right as we speak, and it has continued for 31 years. Interesting uh, that it's, uh, it was revealed by the sun, so things are changing with next generations maybe, but that's another discussion. Uh, other Shadi, um, you know the family very well. You know uh, Nargis, the mother of Mariam, you know Mariam. Um, do you think there's closure now for her, or do she, does she still, is she still trying to get the pieces together of her first years? What happened? I think we hear her uh, um, statement at the end of the film, so uh, that she said that I'm sorry for all you have uh, gone through, and I, I think it's, Nobody can say how Mariam feels now or, or, or Nargis, but I think the film is uh, um, speaking about all the situation, all the relation between them, and, and, and I love them, and I don't want to talk about them when they are not present here. So, uh, but I, I think what Mariam did in the Iranian community for the next generation, with making this film is a great, great work. So, and I am really thankful, and I didn't think that the film will be such a film, so it's that an amazing I can go two times, three times yes, with all too. the sense. So yes. it's great, and it's, it's really, really, really yeah. layered. Yeah. There's history, there's family history, there's yeah. a lot about Iranian culture, about the, uh, well, keeping things uh, nicely and keeping up appearances. Well. For those who have uh, a little more energy, maybe there are one or two questions to these lovely ladies from abroad. Uh, or maybe a statement, or a personal story, or you're just tired. <laughs> and also, is there someone I can bring? Yes, I come to you. Don't fall, fall on the stairs now. I will be the second one. Hi. Oh, you look a bit like Mariam. Yes, yeah. I think all Persians look a little bit like each other. First of all, I would like to apologize for my English. Sorry if I make any mistakes. Um, I have a question for Shadi in the red. <laughs> um, you just informed us that all the high functions in Iran are uh, currently um, people that did terrible things. And I was wondering what, you, what your opinion is about the future, because these people will die eventually, what will, what, what is the prospect for the future? Is there more space for change or is the regime strong enough to keep it this way? Thank you for your question. Which, which Shadi would 
like to answer that question. Um, I think, thank, thank you so much for the question because um, it actually gave me an opportunity to uh, say something that I should have said before. Um, because on the one hand, we have that absolute impunity, but on the other hand, we shouldn't forget that people have struggled uh, for truth and justice and human rights over the past four decades. Uh, in this struggle, those who have been seeking for truth and justice, the families, uh, and in particular, the mothers of the victims have been courageously uh, fighting for uh, knowing the fate and whereabouts of their children. They were the ones who discovered the mass graves of the political pr prisoners for the first time. They were the ones who transmitted the message to the outside world in, the, uh, in uh, October, November, right at this time in 1988, that they are killing our children. And, and I think they are the symbol of the hope and uh, a democratic and uh, human Iran in the future. I think as a human rights activist, as someone who came from a grassroots movement, uh, my hope is always with the people. And, and I think the uprising, the recent uprising, showed us that the, the uh, the desire for change is it's so great in Iran, and people are ready even to die for freedom and democracy and economic prospect. So I think instead of thinking that these individuals who have perpetrated the most heinous crimes would die someday, and the change would come someday as a result of them dying, I think we, we need to invest, uh, invest on people, help them to get rid of this situation that they don't deserve at all. Thank you, Shadi. Okay, we do one last question. Who was first? You? Was it her? I think women first. Yes. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Yasaman. Um, and I was wondering, how many more uh, of survivors and children born in Nevin would it take us to uh, maybe organize a new tribunal, tribunal and um, get the justice we want? Um, are you referring to Iran's tribunal, the yes. people's tribunal? Um, I think... Um, so we, had, we saw some scenes of the People's Iran Tribunal, and, um, and I think it was a great uh, project, and it had a great result, but I don't think that it should be repeated again, because the judgment of Iran Tribunal is still with us, and this is our responsibility uh, because according to that judgment, it's a, lo it's a long judgment, I think it's 170 pages, and uh, it um, basically uh, goes on and on with different kinds of crime, and yeah. at the end, uh, uh, it, the, the judges had a very great legal analysis, and in very deep legal analysis in reaching to the conclusion that crime <laughs> against humanity occurred in the 1980s in Iran. Um, so I think that judgment, uh, as well as the other um, reports that we have, are enough for us as activists or for us as human rights defenders to, um, for our advocacy work. So we need to use them instead of creating another Iran's tribunal, using the results of Iran's tribunal and other documentation that have uh, been uh, conducted over the past few years, um, in order to get justice uh, from the international mechanisms. One of the ideas that we have always dreamed of 
was uh, that the UN established a, a, an independent uh, commission of inquiry on the 1980s atrocity. So that is our homework. So and would a group of survivors like Mariam and like I myself was born in Evin, would it help if we got together and we started something? Definitely. Why not? Because it would be such a personal... Yeah, because your voice is missing. Yeah. Your voice and the voice of other survivors. Yeah. Yeah. Mariam, but, but as you saw, Mariam was alone. And Mariam is still alone. So your voice is missing, your face is missing in this movement. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, I, I'm glad I met her on Sunday. Oh, okay. It's amazing. Great. Thank you. So thank we, you. Should, we you. should start the, our new movement. Yeah, thank you for speaking yeah, up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So you're already in contact with her. Oh, that's great. Do you, maybe it's too personal, but do you have any idea what happened with you the first year? Yes? Your parents, they talk about it. Mariam and I were prison buddies, <laughs> so we talked and, uh, yeah, and my parents were, yeah. So I got, also got a lot of information and uh, I knew from a very young age that I was born in Evin, so um, I went through this much earlier in my life. Uh, but I was so proud of her, yeah, I, yeah, I was so proud of her. There's so much recognition, there's so much, um, yeah. Very proud. I look forward to meeting the other girls. And yeah, <laughs> this is something Facebook can do. <laughs> Thank you. So we are very happy to have you here. Thank you for sharing your story. So I mu yes, <laughs> I think that's a beautiful ending to our evening. Thank you. Thank both of the Shadis, Shadi Sutter, Shadi Amin. And thank you all for uh, staying with us. So, have a beautiful ITFA. And, uh, well, we have a program tomorrow. And uh, see you next year, hope. <laughs>